Hi, welcome back. This is the third in a series of four webcasts that I'm doing on tech companies, and in particular, what I view as the compressed life cycle at tech companies. Let me back up and explain. I believe that all businesses go through a life cycle. They start it, they grow, they mature, and then they decline. Tech companies go through the same cycle, but they go through it much faster than typical companies, and the rationale is very simple. What allows tech companies to grow fast is they can enter businesses easily, they can scale up fast, and they can get customers to switch to their products much more easily than in other businesses. That's what allows them to grow fast. This is great, right? But those same features work against them once they become mature because other companies can enter easily, scale up fast, and switch their customers away from them, which means that if you're a typical tech company, your life cycle happens in compressed form. In my, in the words that I used in my, in my, in, in the webcast I did on this particular topic, I described tech companies as aging in dog years. Now, what I'd like to talk about, though, in this session, is the challenges that management at these companies, founders, owners of these companies face because of the compressed life cycle. As I see it, there are three choices you have if you run, manage, own a tech company. The first is to accept reality, which is this is a short life cycle. You're going to enjoy it while you can, and you can live a short but glorious life, and you're going to make decisions accordingly. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to talk about the potential dark side of that, which is you have a short life cycle, but you live in denial, acting like you have a long life. The second is you argue that it's tech products that have life cycle, short life cycles, not tech companies, and if you can create a portfolio of tech products. In other words, you can take a successful tech product and use it to reseed the growth machine, that you can keep going back to that growth machine and maybe keep creating products that will allow you to grow for a much longer period. And there's a third possibility. You could try to change the business you're in to make it look more like a non-tech business. So let's start with the first one. In the acceptance strategy, here's what you do. You accept the fact that you have a short life cycle and you manage the company accordingly, which means that during the high growth phase, all you focus on is growth, growth and still more growth. You don't get distracted by control or debt or any of the other issues that can take your focus away from growing. Once you get to the mature phase, you know you don't have long to live there, so you enjoy yourself to the maximum. You make the most money you can. You you, you essentially live through that mature phase knowing that it's not going to last very long. And the, uh, the, the advice that most mature companies get, which is to borrow money, use that with restraint if you're a tech company because your mature phase is not going to last as long as a Coca-Cola or a consumer product company. And in decline, you know things are going to happen very fast, so your cash flows have to go into hyperdrive. You've got to return a lot more cash than typical companies, and dividends alone probably won't do the trick. You've got to supplement them either with special dividends or stock buybacks. So you have a short life, you live like you have a short life, and you manage your company well given that short life. The dark side of this particular strategy is you accept the fact that you have a short life, but you live as if you have a long life. That's denial. So what you do is you go out and borrow money like a non-tech company when you're mature. You refuse to return cash when you're in decline. Those things can happen. So think of that as the dark side of this particular strategy. The second strategy is what I call reseed and regrow. What, uh, and as I, I, as I described it earlier, what you do is you take a successful product and you've been successful with it. You use the cash flows and earnings from that product to reseed the growth machine. What does that mean? You try to come up with a second and a third and a fourth product. Sounds promising, right? Lots of companies try it, but there are two things I would like you to keep in mind. First is reseeding the machine can extend your life, but it can increase your value only if the cost of reseeding the machine is less than the benefits you get. So if you go out and you try to keep acquiring new products with acquisitions, it's true you can extend your life as a growth company, but you'll be paying out so much in the process of acquisitions that you'll have a longer life but a lower value. The other thing to be wary about is remember that that this strategy is going to get more and more difficult the more successful you get. Let's, let's see why. You have a successful first product, adding a second product might not be such a big deal. You have two successful products, adding a third product is going to become more difficult because each new product will have to be more successful than the previous one, just have an impact on your growth because you're scaling up. In fact, here's one of the great ironies. The most successful your initial product is, the more difficult it is to pull off the strategy. So if you have an incredibly successful first product, coming up with that second product might be very, very difficult to do because to make an impact, it's got to be a really large second product and those are tough to pull off. 
There's a third strategy. And to me, this is the place to go if you're the management or a founder of a company. Remember those three things that made it easy for you to grow? That you could enter the business easily, that you could scale up quickly, and that you could get customers to switch to you because they were not sticky, they were not sticking with existing products. What do you want to do now that you've crossed the, in a sense, you've crossed the river with a bridge is to burn the bridge down. What you've effectively got to do is make the business more difficult to enter. How? By bringing in, maybe, maybe adding patents, legal protections against entry, maybe adding gatekeepers to the game. Gatekeepers weren't there when you entered the business, but that you created to keep new, new entrants out. Maybe you can increase the cost of scaling up. Maybe you can change your product or your distribution system, your marketing, to increase the, the amount of money that your competitors will have to spend to enter the same business. And whatever you can do to make your customer, your product more sticky, where customers are more find it more difficult to leave your product, the, essentially you're extending your life cycle. And how can you make customers more stuck on your product? Well, you can add features that in a sense, acquire information about them while they use it. So when they leave, they, that information all goes to waste or creates a work product that does not easily translate into a new product. I'll give you a personal example. I've been frustrated with Microsoft Office at different times and to different degrees over the last 15 years. I've thought about leaving, but the longer I stay with Office, the more difficult it becomes for me to leave because I think about those thousands of files that I have that are PowerPoint, Excel, and Word files. And I think about the potential problems I will have when I try to convert them. I mean, every new product claims it can convert things painlessly, but I've, I've done this before. And I know there's no such thing as painlessly when it comes to conversion. The more difficult it becomes for me to leave Microsoft Office. That stickiness is what's kept Office or Microsoft as successful in that business for as long as it has. So three choices, either live the life of a short life cycle, manage your company for a short life cycle. The second is try to extend that life cycle by coming up with new products. And the third is to change your business model. You know, what I'd like to do is frame this actually in terms of, uh, uh, of what you see often used by value investors to explain what kinds of companies they've invested. And the analogy they use is the analogy of a moat. They want to invest in companies that have moats. You're saying, what the hell are you talking about? A moat essentially is a competitive advantage that's so strong that your competitors can't come across it. So with value investors, the argument is you should invest in companies with wide moats. I'm going to draw that analogy and I think I'm going to enrich it, maybe extend it beyond its breaking point. But think about it this way. Think about this originally as a, as a lush island in the middle of nowhere nothing on it, surrounded by a waterway filled with crocodiles, a horribly dangerous waterway. So you have a group of adventurers who see the island. They say, look, you know, I'd like to get across the island. So over decades, they build this drawbridge. It takes them a lot of pain, a lot of effort, a lot of resources. And finally, they get the drawbridge done. They walk across the dangerous waterway. Now they're on the island. They draw up the drawbridge and they build a castle. It's their island. They control it and they live. I would say happily ever after, but they live happily for a period. In fact, they're so comfortable on the island that they forget about the fact that they have to maintain the waterway and feed the crocodiles. They essentially let their weapons become ancient, you know, convinced that the, that the drawbridge is strong. Nobody can come across it. At some point in time, the waterway becomes a little stream. See the stream over here? And the barbarians notice that it's just a stream. They realize the drawbridge is up, but they don't care about the drawbridge. So think of the barbarians as the tech disruptors and think of the people on the island as the incumbent businesses in non-tech, in, in, in incumbent companies in non-tech businesses. The barbarians start coming across the water. Initially, the incumbents don't even notice that they're coming across. And then they notice and say, oh my God, they're coming across the water. So they, uh, they, they tell their gods to fire the crossbows. Remember, their, their weapons are ancient. The crossbows might take out a few barbarians, but there are too many of them. Some of them make it into the island. They come with advanced weapons. They blow away your defense. They take over the island. They now own the island. This is tech disruption in a nutshell, right? The island used to be car service. The drawbridge used to be regulations and rules. The car service companies came across. They controlled the island. They thought they controlled the island until Uber and Lyft and Didi Kwadi decided that they could cross the water. Now, of course, that the tech companies on the island, they have a choice to make. They can say, look, you know, there's only a stream out there, a tiny stream. Other barbarians are going to come across. We're going to eat and be merry while we have a chance. That's the first strategy, the acceptance strategy, where you know you will not be in control of the island for very long. The second is, 
Maybe you can go pay for extra advanced weaponry. The weapon makers, of course, love this. This will, of course, be doing acquisitions, hiring bankers, doing what you need to do to keep the barbarians at bay. That's a second strategy. Extend your growth strategy. The third, of course, is to change the business, which means dig the moat, make it deeper, create your own drawbridge. That's effectively what I'm talking about in terms of the three strategies that tech companies have. Now, let's bring this all together. If you think about what what I've just said, and you buy into my argument that tech company life cycles are short, and there's a story to be told about management as well. Because the kind of skill set you need at each stage in the life cycle is different. Early in the life cycle when you're a startup, you need a visionary CEO. Somebody can tell a great story, sell an idea. As you go into growth, you need a builder. Somebody can take that great idea and make it into a product or a service and start building growth, building markets. As those markets get built up, you need an opportunist. Somebody can see, look around and say, hey, that's a great growth potential and go for it, but go for it selectively. Once you've built up your business and become a mature business, you've got to defend the business. So you need a CEO as a defender who can come up with competitive advantages to keep the competition up. As that mature phase starts to ease, your growth starts to go away, you've got to become realistic. You can't grow anymore. You've got to accept the fact that you're now a mature company. In the last phase, when you're in decline, you need to get out of the business. You need a liquidator. Now, here's the challenge. In a typical non-tech company, this can take decades. So the visionary CEO gets a chance to live out his 20 or 25 years and pass the baton on to the builder, the opportunist, the defender. So by the time you get to the decline phase, it's a very different CEO running the company. So you have a chance, at least, of having a natural transition from one manager to another. But imagine being a tech company where all of this happens in compressed time, maybe in 25 years. You could actually have the same person be CEO of this company who was the CEO at the startup now still remain the CEO. And you can already see the problem it's going to create. If you're a great visionary CEO, but you cannot bring yourself to being a realist or to liquidate, you're going to be the wrong CEO for your company. So essentially, I think at tech companies, you have more of the makings of a problem with founder CEO stay, staying on well beyond their expiration date, if, if I can put it that way, which also means that you can, the implications that come out of that are pretty strong. First is, you're going to see more value destruction at tech companies in their mature and decline phases because many of these companies are still run by founder CEOs and management who grew with these companies, which is a growth company, and still bring those bad, those old habits to a company where it's no longer appropriate. So this is going to show up in lots of different ways. The friction between management and investors at tech companies is going to come to the surface sooner rather than later because of the short life cycle. And here's how it's going to manifest itself. You're far more likely to see tech companies go into value destruction mode, where they keep trying to grow when growth is gone, partly because the founder CEO and the management of this company is still the same management and founder CEO that pushed the company through growth and cannot give up on the fact that the company no longer has growth. It's almost personal. The second is, you're more likely, as a result of this, to see more CEOs removed at tech companies because they're beyond their due date. Investors look at them and say, you're no longer the right CEO for the company. And this could happen very early in the process because a tech company can go from being a great company, an incredible growth company, to a mature or declining company in four to five years. You're also going to see, and this is a natural follow-up, that activist investors are going to start targeting tech companies a lot more than they have historically. Because we're starting to see tech companies age in front of our eyes. This is, in fact, the first generation of aging tech companies. So don't be surprised to see what's happening at Yahoo, Happen, and other tech companies. And finally, this is one reason to be wary about all these new, th this new class of voting and non-voting shares you've seen at tech companies in the last decade, starting with Google, of course, but going all the way through the social media companies. Investors, of course, n right now don't seem to care about the fact that they don't get the voting rights of the insiders at these companies, because these companies are in the growth phase. And in a sense, you're saying as an outsider, I don't know much about growth. I'm going to let these guys make the decisions. But there will come a day. When the growth drops off and these same founder CEOs that you revere right now as great managers are going to do things that you wish they wouldn't do. And you're going to, be, you're going to bemoan the fact that you no longer have the voting rights. So if you give up voting rights today, I'd like you to think about that tomorrow when you will be wishing for those voting rights because that tomorrow will come sooner than you think at most tech companies. Managing tech companies is not easy. I'm not claiming it is. But in, in a sense, you have to take into account this shortened life cycle in how you approach management of the companies. 
because almost everything we know about management was it was in a sense taught to us from a non-tech business version where life cycles lasted a long period. I hope you enjoyed the session.